Right, evening everyone and welcome to the first in our series of uh, BIX webinars. Uh, hopefully uh, some of you have managed to join us this evening and are looking forward to the exciting lineup of speakers that we've got. Sadly we weren't able to meet as we were planning to in Belfast this year um, but we have got a series of evening webinars and we'll be sharing more details of the forthcoming weeks coming up. Um, we've got four speakers tonight, or well, five speakers, but four subjects. Um, we're going to be starting off with Andrew Weeks talking about humani humanising language. We've got an update on I Decide with Lisa Ramsey and Alison Wright. We've got an update on the, the CERN study with Mary Adams, and we've got an update around communicating risk from Claire Murphy. Um, we will be inviting questions. Please use the chat function, uh, put some questions in there. You won't be able to ask correct questions directly to the speakers, but if you put them in the comments, um, then we will pick them up. So we will have the opportunity to ask questions of the speakers um, uh, after each presentation, and then there'll be a time at the end um, for, the, uh, for questions right at the very end as well. Um, and we'll be aiming to finish by 8.30 at the very latest. So uh, with that, over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thanks, Susie. Um, right, let me see if I can share my screen. Let's see if this works. Um, there we go. Is that working? Are you you getting my first slide up? Okie doke. So, not, not yet, Andy. Uh, not come up yet? Not yet. Um, <laughs> okay, well that's a bad start. It uh, uh, worked beautifully a few minutes ago, didn't it? Um, well, I wonder why that's not... I wonder if that... Let's try... Okay, there you go. There, perfect. How's that? Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, see that? Yep, you know, fine. Well, schoolboy error. We should have got used to it by this stage in the pandemic, shouldn't we? Okay, so what I'm, can I ask people who are attending, can you try and get a pen and paper with you? Um, there's a couple of times during this that I want you to write things down. Uh, yeah, you see, you're going to have to participate a little bit. So if you can just make sure you've got a pen and paper so you can just scribble something down uh, halfway through, because I want a bit of your input. Now, what we say to people, the words we use, uh, tell, uh, tell us a lot about other people. And when we meet people, of course, we judge on their appearance, we judge on their, exact, their actions, maybe on their expressions. But actually, we judge it mainly on what they say. And what we say reveals a lot about us as people. And certainly with first meetings with people, when, when we meet people socially, you're, you're quite careful with your language, you, you're anxious not to offend and to get it right. And maybe that's why with old friends or with family, um, you actually feel so comfortable because you relax, because you know that you're not going to be judged on what you say. There's uh, so much uh, sort of history behind you. When uh, I, one of my training uh, jobs was in Sheffield at the old Jessops and um, it was a great place. But I remember sitting down for a chat once with, uh, with all the midwives and doctors and we were just chewing things over on a quiet moment on Labour Ward. And um, I, we started talking about language and, and about offensive swear words, as, as you do. Uh, and uh, out came the, the N-word, and people, ooh, you can't use the N-word, uh, and out came the C-word, and then they said, oh, and, and the B-word, that's the B-word is the worst. I was, uh, what's the B-word? And, and over in my head, I was thinking, oh, bum, uh, bugger, uh, 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 breasts, uh, boobies. Um, oh, God, I can't think of what. And what was it, in fact, in the end? The word which was so offensive, which was worse to them than both the C word and the N word, was bastard. Now, that completely shocked me because I was, hey, what, what do you mean? I use that all the time. Well, you know, I, I come from a background down south and we were bastard. You know, it was a commonly thrown around amongst, amongst my friends and it had no offensiveness to it at all. And of course, up north, we were, hey, you bastard. It was almost a funny sort of phrase but to, to those people in that meeting on that day that was the most offensive word that you could use and of course that means that these words are all very contextual then 
so my family, I, I come from, uh, my father's a Methodist minister, I come from a religious background. And actually the most offensive word that you could use when you're swearing with my father is, is not any of uh, these sort of words. Actually, it's to use the word God or to use Jesus or Christ uh, as a swear word. Uh, and uh, that is, in so many people's language, they commonly say, oh God, and, but actually that's quite offensive. Um, for me, actually, I'm sort of used to that. Um, but uh, the one I can't get used to is is the habit in some cultures of calling people motherfuckers. And I'm sort of, really? Motherfucker? What, what? But actually, it just trips off the tongue for some people. And it's, it's a, a sort of a commonly used phrase. And so, actually, you can see how th these, these are just words. Uh, but actually, if you use them, you're you'll immediately provoke a reaction. And you actually don't know the culture that somebody's coming from until you, uh, uh, until you use those words. And so they change according to culture, but actually they change according to time. So the bastard, Shakespearean, is, is it not? And, and I thought it was a very common used word, and, but for some it's offensive. What about words, terminology for cerebral palsy? I mean, we had the Spastic Society, did we not, uh, going back into the 60s and 70s. And everyone said, well, that's fine. That's just, a, it's purely a description. It's an anatomical description. Why? But actually, with time, it's evolved into, a, uh, into an offensive word, a, a term of abuse. And so you're seeing how people are having to change. And so now what was the Spastic Society is now scope. Uh, and, so, and so things move on. What for me, one of the words I really struggle with uh, is uh, fetal distress. Now that's sort of odd, and you may go, "Oh, Andrew, get a life! You've been spent too long in academia." Um, but fetal distress is one of those words which I sort of hadn't thought about. I, and I've been thirty years in obstetrics now, and and we'd sort of grown up with that word, and it just flicks into everyday parlance when when you're talking about it. Um, and actually, it's in we'll use it the whole time. And if you go into, I don't know, this is a report from each baby's counts a couple of years ago, we talk about a baby becoming distressed and the sign of distress. And it's actually such a familiar term and such an easy term to listen to that we forget that actually it's really quite a, um, a difficult word for many. And if you go to a, you know, what does distress mean? Now, it's all very well that if, if you're using one of these terms within just a uh, um, uh, within the medical group or within midwifery and if you're just talking amongst yourselves then that's sort of easy and you can use some of these very difficult terms but the difficulty is that of course that that's not just where they're used and the more you use them within those groups actually they they, they leak out and you you end up using terms like fetal distress to to women in labor now, to, to me, it, what does fetal distress mean? It means a slight change in the uh, CTG or uh, something like that. Or, or actually, I may be thinking this is hypoxia, fetal hypoxia. But in no way am I using the uh, dictionary definition. What's the dictionary definition? Well, go to your dictionary and see to cause somebody anxiety, sorrow or pain. Well, who's talking about the fetus being anxious or in sorrow or in pain? No, 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 we don't mean that. We mean we're thinking there might be some hypoxia, but we use the term distress. And actually, if you go, you go, OK, well, no, in the thesaurus, we'll go into the thesaurus and we'll find, uh, you know, where it says this can also be used for fetal hypoxia. Uh, and actually, you don't find it there at all. Other words meaning the same as distress, wretched, arouse anxiety, disquiet, oppress, plague, tormenting, tragic, pitiful. You know, oh God, no, that's, that's not what we mean. That's not what we mean at all. We're not talking about a baby who's sitting in the uterus saying, please let me out. I'm, I'm in such danger. I'm in, I, I'm, but actually that's what it means to somebody who's hearing it. Now, fetal distress is my my bet noir is it well that's that's the one that i dislike but actually maternity care is ridden with these words uh, and uh so distress is one of them but what about section what about labor itself i mean labor who hasn't heard of labor and maybe that's easier because that's such a, a ubiquitous term that so many people use that term and think of it that they don't actually think of it as labor as 
uh, in terms of physical labor, in terms of um, uh, what about trial, pain, instrumental, rupture, incompetent when you're talking about cervix. Now, I mean, that's a difficult one. How come is that? How has that still stayed with us uh, over all these years? I mean, if somebody's um, got fecal soiling, you don't you don't talk of a man as oh you've got incompetent anus, do you? I mean, it's technically correct, I guess. Well, I mean, it would be technically correct also to talk about erectile dysfunction as incompetent penis, but we don't go around saying this is the incompetent penis clinic, do we? Uh, because actually, we're a little bit more diplomatic about it. And yet, somehow, incompetent cervix has, has remained in our, in our parlance. We talk of inadequate pelvis. Now, of course, the difficulty with all these terms is, well, how are you going to replace it? Because actually replacing it isn't at all easy. Uh, and I've tried to do this, and, and it's, it's, it's not easy. Just take fetal distress, for example. You might go, okay, well, I, okay, Andrew, I accept fetal distress. No, that's not a good one. Let's, let's change it. Um, what about the fetal heart rate is dropping or falling. That's a, that's a nice one. It's, it's anatomically correct. It's, it's descriptive. And yet, hmm, the heart really holds a very iconic position in the body. And to talk about it dropping or falling, it sounds as if you, you're doing heart surgery and you've dropped it on the floor. You, you know, that's not quite right either. Um, so how do you change it? I mean, you could talk of changes in the fetal heart rate or maybe changes in the baby's pulse is maybe easier but all these become quite complicated and we're so used to fetal distress that it's sort of easier just to say fetal distress but we need to have these conversations because the, these words are not good i came to all this and you might say well blimey, andrew I, th I thought you were interested in third stage of labor and global health why are you suddenly talking about language where's all this come from actually it came from when i was doing postnatal debriefs debriefs and um when uh, i used to uh, do those it was amazing how often people came uh, with uh, having had a difficult experience in labor and actually when you got down to the nub of it actually the care was was good i mean you could find minor things but but actually the care on the whole was fine but what was difficult was the communication uh, and they would hear that somebody had spoken in a funny way and they had said something and you could just tell they didn't like me or they, that there was, um, they hadn't explained it properly or they'd overheard that the baby was distressed and this had really set them off and anxious because they knew if somebody else had had a stillbirth and they just imagined then their baby was in distress, et cetera, et cetera. And so I came quite interested then in language and how that works. In fact, uh, just two days ago, um, uh, just as I was thinking, what am I going to say at this, this talk on Tuesday? Um, the uh, up popped in my uh, inbox uh, th this survey. Um, so this is women's experience of birth trauma. They discussed it with everyone, who, uh, women who had had birth trauma, and they reviewed all the papers around it. This is from Australia. I think this is even pre-publication yet. Uh, and what had they found? They'd found really exactly what I've found in my postnatal debriefs, that the common themes in, um, uh, in birth trauma was both healthcare providers and the maternity care system. Um, the women's sense, you can see it down the bottom here, women's sense of knowing and control. So feeling out of control, feeling that they're not being uh, given the ability to, um, uh, to decide what's going on uh, and support. Now, it's interesting because you might think, well, women's experience of birth trauma, clearly that, that must be about um, uh, people who, who have had uh, birth injuries or uh, about the woman themselves has been injured. And interestingly, it's, a lot of this is, is actually about communication. And it's about support. Um, so the, the other area of which I was particularly interested in then of, with my global health hat on was with respectful care. And uh, people maybe know the White Ribbon Alliance and um, I've seen somebody's raised their hand. Maybe we'll have questions at the end if that's okay. Um, let me just finish off and then I'll, uh, we can have questions. Um, 
with my global health hat on, respectful care is a huge theme these days. And what I think we realised was that um, people were providing health care in, in low resource settings. And what you found was that people weren't turning up for it. And a lot of that was related to how they felt they were going to be treated. And you might say, ah, yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's where you work, Andrew, in, in, in Africa. That's, that's something different. We don't have our problems here. Um, but of course we do. And, and if you speak to people coming for debriefs, often it's, it's a, a feeling that they've not had respectful care, that they've not been given choices, which is important. And language is a huge part of that. Of course, litigation is also an important part. And with Montgomery, we know how important it is to get our communication right. Um, what I guess I hadn't thought about really was that it, this was going to improve outcomes. Because those of us who come from a medical background have been brought up with a, a very dichotomous model of where you've got um, uh, the medical side and outcomes and uh, 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 poor APGARs or fetal hypoxia and bad outcomes like that. And then you've got the nicey nicey side of labour and somehow we brought up with the idea that somehow those are split. And looking at some Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you think, well, there's the basic needs and then there's this, these sort of esteem needs at the top, the feelings of accomplishment, and they're nice, but they don't really affect the others. And you can put it into maternity. You can say, well, actually, we're, as medics, we're really, it's preventing harm and preventing death. That's our key thing. And actually, good birth experience, that's a nice, nice thing. But of course, what you come to realize is that actually they're all integrated uh, and the good birth experience is absolutely integral to good outcomes and that's there in the literature it's there repeatedly um, you just look for example at uh, the Cochrane Review of Continuous Support for Women in Childbirth um, and this can be yes it can be continuous support by midwives uh, or it can be continuous support by family or by non-family non-medics people like doulas and what happens just by having that support this isn't some kind of magic antibiotic this isn't some kind of new device or new contraption what do they find increased spontaneous vaginal birth decreased cesarean section Ch reduced need for analgesia, lower APGAR score. Oh my goodness. So actually it's improving outcomes as well as just, um, uh, um, uh, as well as just being a nice aspect of care. The whole thing actually is integrated. And if we get the birth experience wrong, then often we get the outcomes wrong as well. So a couple of years ago, we set, um, uh, I'd met up with uh, somebody called Catherine Williams. Um, who uh, came to speak at a, a, a conference we were running on the NICE guidelines and we got chatting about language. I can't quite remember how it came up, um, but um, we got chatting about it and decided that we were going to try and investigate this a little bit. And so I put out a survey. I don't know if people are part of the MATEX group, maybe many of you are already, but this is a both Facebook and Twitter group um, where uh, you can discuss maternity experience, how you provide good quality experience care. And it's a fascinating group uh, if anyone wants to join. The, um, but I put it to that group. So uh, what language do you find difficult and what, how would you like to uh, see it improved? And what would you suggest as alternatives? And we went on to write uh, this blog here uh, called Humanizing Birth, Does Language We Use Matter? Um, and the uh we got blimey it was like a tsunami uh, just asking that question what words do you find difficult goodness it was um words came from all over um and suddenly within days we had uh, hundreds of different words which people were unhappy about and what we went on to do then was to try and sort those out um and uh, natalie who was a medical student on attachment with me at the time um catherine who um is actually a consumer representative. She used to work with the NCT and has gone on to be one of the authors of the NICE guidelines and is now a leading light in uh, the National Maternity Voices. But we sat down to try and say, well, how can we try and classify these terms? And we, we came up with a six part classification for them. Um, and there were some expressions which clearly were problematic. So there were some which were anxiety provoking or overdramatic or violent. 
and it was really quite sad how many of them there were. There were others which were discouraging or insensitive, and there were others which were codified or exclusive. Now you have your piece of paper in front of you, I think, and I want you, you've got 30 seconds, try and think of some words which are, relate to those three things. Go on, yeah, yeah, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit and wait, I've got my clock here. Um, what words can you think which fulfil those? I've spoken about a number of them already. But actually, it's a very interesting exercise sitting down and trying to work out which of these, what words we use every day fit into, into these. You can put some of them in the chat box if you like. So those were three different types. And then we found that, th that there was others which related to communication styles. Uh, and some people got very offended about language which didn't respect women as individuals. And I'll sh show you some examples of them. So they became just a cervix who's seven centimeters or just the primate or just the eruption. There were other phrases which were infantilizing and, and that's, maybe that's a strange word to use, but they were sort of somehow patronizing or belittling words. Um, I've, uh, we had a trainee with us a few years ago who used to call everyone sweetheart. The, uh, uh, she didn't call me sweetheart, um, which is probably just as well. Um, but whenever she met a woman in labor, she would call her sweetheart. And there was a sense in which that was lovely. And she was a lovely motherly figure. She, she the most caring person that I know. And I think she probably would have liked to have also been called sweetheart if she was in labor but I could see some women sort of bristle as suddenly this 20 year old was calling them sweet, was being called sweetheart. And then finally the phrases of not accepting women as a decision maker. So just in the last couple of minutes, I'll show you some of the words we came up with. And um, uh, so anxiety, phrases that are anxiety provoking, over dramatic or violent, we've already had some of them. Uh, fetal distress, trial, labour, rupture of the membranes, bloody show, big baby. So there's a number of people who see big baby as a negative thing. And it's interesting because that hadn't, hadn't occurred to me. Um, but actually, this isn't really about me. This is one of the interesting things about this exercise. And if you do it amongst groups, one of the intriguing things is that uh, actually there's words for here which aren't offensive to me at all. A bloody show, well, duh that's what it is. Um, it's called a spade a spade, but actually if that's upsetting to somebody, then, then we need to listen to that. We need to hear that. Finding alternatives, not easy at all. Not easy at all. Um, there's some which have come in uh, and which are fairly easy. So trial of forceps, I, I haven't used for some time. And I talk to women to see if we help the baby out using forceps. Um, uh, what about rupture of the membranes? I routinely use release the waters now. It's it's very easy to change on that one. It's more difficult with things like big baby and healthy baby because is that a better phrase? I don't know if it is. Um, what about avoiding discouraging or insensitive language? Um, there's a load of these fail, poor maternal effort. That uh, creates problems. Uh, failure to progress, terminating pregnancy, higher, high risk. High risk's an interesting one because you'd go, well, high risk, well, that's what it is, high risk. Um, but actually people don't f feel that very negatively. And if they feel that negatively, let's see how we can try and improve things. Or um, so what did the MATEX group come up with? Uh, unsuccessful induction, that's, that's fair enough, or not finding it easy. Compassionate induction, I, I like that for, um, uh, for people saying having terminations for fetal abnormalities um, or, or where they've had intrauterine fetal deaths. I, I think that's, uh, that's very good. Some of these work very nicely, others of them are difficult. Medically complex does work very easily compared to high risk strong contractions or even st surges people like strong surges so it doesn't have the negative connotation 
Um, then respecting women as individuals. This is a, a, an interesting one. So um, a lot of these are terminologies which you might use within uh, the sort of the, the midwives or, the, or, or the, the midwife station or the, the obstetric station at the back. And you talk about, well, going consenter. Um, and actually I find that difficult because it very much is, right, I'm going to go and do this action to, <laughs> to, to this poor woman. I'm going to go and consent her. And, and actually sometimes that comes across in the consent process as well. So what do we talk about? Well, you can go and see if she's happy with that, ask her to sign a consent form or discuss informed consent. Um, now, of course, having used these for 30 years, these are quite difficult to change. Um, and we probably don't need to change them all in all situations because if you knew the woman well enough, it's the same with, with my family or with, uh you, you know if, if you know somebody well enough you you know what's going to offend them and what's not and what's going to be good language and what's not but the trouble is when i walk into a room to do a cesarean section or, or something on the whole i've had a very limited uh, relationship with that person uh, and i'm seeing them briefly and then i need to go very careful probably the answer actually is continuity of carer because then if you know that person then actually you can uh, continue through uh, and you you know what's right for them and so um, the final group which I'll present now um, re respecting the women's autonomy as a decision maker people didn't like you have to you need a cesarean section or you're not allowed to do this and actually that's that's quite tricky isn't it because actually we're healthcare providers we're not um we're, we're we're not about telling people what they must or mustn't do um we're there offering the service and actually we're giving um medical advice on the whole so how would you change that you could recommend um uh, so all interesting aspects of different language and ways we can try and uh, change it so what are we going to do to move forward well um i think we do need to find new phrases and and when we're uh, in a clinical situation um i don't think it's good enough to say oh well we use this uh, codified or this this language uh behind the scenes but then when we go and speak to women we speak in a different way because that those lang that language slips out i think so i think we do need to find new phrases and then actually get into good habits learn to use them use to learn to use them both in front of women but also behind the scenes as well because they'll sure uh, they'll certainly slip out um, uh, and finally I, th I think actually the answer is to try and personalize care and get continuity of care that's the key thing to to do and if we could do that actually that would solve an awful lot of problems and in the same way that i don't um, uh, use things which offend my my parents or my wife or my children I adjust my language a little bit according to each one um, uh, actually we would ideally do that with with women as well so that's all I wanted to say um, uh, I'll stop uh, sharing my screen now and I think then uh, Louise can take that back let me see if I can that. I see there's not been lots of questions. I keep seeing something flash up on my screen saying new question. I'm thinking, oh my God, what have I said? I bet I've said something, uh, said something controversial, but then that's... Uh... No, I think it was great. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was really good. Um, and I think on the chat, I think there's just been kind of lots of comments around some of that language. I think if anybody's got a question to ask, if you could post it in the chat and then we'll pick it up and I'll ask Andrew um, if that's possible. I suppose one of the questions I had really was around the implementation of this and what barriers you've faced. For example, um, within my own trust, failure to progress is within one of the tick boxes within our uh, electronic data capture um, and is therefore really difficult. No matter how hard I try, I really struggle to get people to stop calling it failure to progress. I was wondering how successful you've been in implementing changes in language within your own organisation. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. Um, and some of it is about helping people to think about it, actually, because there's things like fetal distress, which I just have never thought about. And because mm -hmm. it's such a, a commonly spoken uh, expression, um, all failure to progress. You, you just don't 
you don't really think about it and and in a sense after 30 years it's quite really quite different to to change to change over so many years especially if you're stressed actually <laughs> you know when you're stressed you revert to, to type don't you and suddenly all these words come out with, uh, and then afterwards you think oh my goodness um, I, I shouldn't really have said that mm -hmm. but um but yeah, it's not easy. Um, in our um, emergency day, we're putting together, we're actually revising it to include a, a lecture on this um, so that it's done uh, uh, as a, as an, on our annual, um, annual training update. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll see. I mean, I, I think a lot of people will go, yeah, come on, Namby Pamby, a load of nonsense. And Actually, I, I don't think that's right, but I think it'll only come, there's such an institutional use of some of these phrases that it's going to take an awful lot to move on. I think it is, it is happening, uh, mm -hmm. and you see a whole new generation of, of obstetricians and midwives coming through um, who are, you know, who, who, who are changing. Um, but, and it's not going to change overnight. But I think talks like this, raising the issue is is part of the solution. Because it's only when you see it and you, you almost hold up that mirror to yourself and your language and you go, oh, really? Did I? What is fetal district? What do people think? I, it's interesting. Um, I was speaking to my father a while back and he said, oh, yes, well, she was bleeding. But actually, she was hemorrhaging. I was hemorrhage well i i study postpartum hemorrhage that's, that's what i do I, I i don't mean that hemorrhage is torrential but clearly for some people there's a concept that you bleed and then you hemorrhage yeah. which is like it's not raining it's pouring um and i've never really considered that and i use hemorrhage i'm afraid in front of women the whole time and and i i've got to think now carefully about how do i rephrase that because that equally is a, is a difficult phrase just a couple that we just I'll take one more question and maybe we can add some more at the end and um, which is do you think there are cultural differences with language oh completely yeah 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 and th that's why that's why we need continuity of care actually um, is because providing care to somebody who's of a slightly different culture um, <laughs> It's a bit like when you go to Tesco's, isn't it? Uh, and actually you can sort of tell, some, some of the cashiers get it right, but others you can just tell that they've been told that they have to say the same thing. Can I help you fill your bag? And if you said, oh yes, please, I've no idea what they would do if you said, yes, I'd like you to fill my bag. But everybody says, can I help you with fill your bag? And I think, really? What? Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a phrase which is plopped out every single time. Um, and that's because they don't know who's in front of them. They have to use those very rote, um, rote phrases for every single person. And I'd like to think that good maternity care is beyond that. Uh, it's somebody who you've known. The ideal would be that somebody or a group of people you've known antenatally who see you through labour and see you postnatally. Um, and that's the best antenatal care because then actually you're with people who you know who you feel comfortable with and maybe you can call somebody sweetheart maybe you can say good girl that's absolutely fine if, if in that sort of intimate relationship but it's not fine with somebody you know uh, and um, you, you, we just have to go very careful if you don't know somebody so all very tricky providing it for, to different cultures. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That was fantastic. So just for everybody who may have joined late, just to let you know, we've got another uh, three speakers. We'll, we'll be taking questions after each speaker and we have allowed some time at the end to go ahead. Um, I'm going to hand over to Lisa Ramsey and Alison Wright, um, who are going to give us an update on the I Decide project. While they are loading up their screens, I'll just tell you a bit about them. So Lisa is the service user voice in the I Decide lead, and Alison Wright is a consultant obstetrician, and she's the national obstetric lead for maternity choice, personalization, and I Decide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susie. So hopefully uh, I will be able to share my screen. Is that okay? Can everyone see that? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Ali. Lovely. Um, so Lisa and I are going to do a double act. Uh, we've been working on I Decide together with, with a group of people from NHS England. Let me see if that's um, good. Okay, brilliant. So um, Lisa's the project lead um, and I'm incredibly lucky, she's amazing. 
um, and there's a, there's a team of people behind I Decide. But just to give you a little bit of background, apologies to those who are familiar, um, but just to briefly cover it for those who aren't, the Montgomery ruling that Andrew's already mentioned was hugely important. Um, and I don't know how many people have heard Nadine Montgomery speak, but when she starts to speak, she always says, I do not blame the doctors involved. Uh, what I want to do is to improve the system. Um, and she is really interested in looking at what we can do to improve the system for women and to support decision making. So, so I decide really came from that ruling and um, Birthrights Charity. I think some of Birthrights team are on the line. Um, so please feel free to chip in later. Um, we had a workshop in Oxford in 2017, which was Birthrights together with NHS England, which Matthew Jolly spearheaded, the National Clinical Director, wanting to look, and he was very um, open about his own experiences, um, which I'm sure many of us as obstetricians share, looking at how we can better improve our communication with women, particularly at difficult times, particularly when we're stressed, um, drawing on, on Andrew, what Andrew said about language. Four o'clock in the morning for me is the very worst time. I know some people say three o'clock, but we need it to, to work for the team at any time of day or night so that we can better communicate with the woman about what's happening. And, and part of that, of course, is antenatal preparedness, which Lisa will say a little bit more about later. But we're really keen that if we talk to a woman at four o'clock in the morning about suggesting that we help the baby out with forceps to follow on from Andrew's language, that it's not ideal if this is the first time that a woman has ever heard of an assisted vaginal delivery. And what we want to do is to make sure that women are more prepared antenatally, unless they really don't want to, but we find that the majority do, so that decision-making is then made easier for her. Um, <clears throat> so we then had a further workshop where we tried to find an acronym which basically described what we wanted to do in I Decide. Now we have to be honest, I Decide is not the perfect acronym and we've kind of tried to make it work um, as best we can. Um, but we were so happy with the concept of I Decide that we have stuck with it. So again, just to, for those of you who have not been familiar previously or heard Lisa and I speak about it before, um, the first I is for immediacy. So we're looking at how urgent is the situation. We are about to start feasibility testing um, on a couple of labor wards. Now we've decided that with the first I immediacy, if it's a category one, when we're just testing the tool, we're not going to use those categories because we think that that's just probably not appropriate. Um, and we need to choose those situations where we've got more time. But once I decide in the future is fully implemented, then the hope is that we can use it also for category one sections or instrumental deliveries or suggested um, interventions. So details of the situation, that's fairly self-explanatory. We would describe to the woman what we were recommending. Personalised care and support plans are something which we are working on. And this means that the woman will state her preferences. Now, I'm not talking about the birth plan where a woman might turn up with her birth plan and it's the first time that she showed it to anyone. What we're encouraging is that a woman will have her own personalised care and support plan, which will be a dynamic thing, an ongoing conversation with other people, particularly the midwives and doctors who are involved in her care, so that when it does come to her birth, None of that is a surprise that it's all been discussed before, including her personalised situation, so her background risk, um, what's happened to her before, whether she's got any medical complications, etc. So <clears throat> the rest of the I and D and E are fairly self-explanatory. Just to be clear, this does not um, supersede the consent process. So if we are going to recommend a woman goes to theatre for a cesarean, we would still go through the written consent as usual. So when we're testing this out, we are not going to be um, <clears throat> replacing any of the things that we already do, but this is aimed to be in addition to help women and to help us in our communication. Uh, lots of this um, has yet to be tested. So I'm very grateful. I know some of you are on the call, some of the obstetricians 
who've already helped us um, to look at how this might work in practice, what are some of the pitfalls, etc. Uh, also grateful to the women and the midwives who've been similarly involved. So a lot's happened um, since I think Lisa spoke to you, was it a year ago, Lisa? So a lot's happened with I Decide, particularly we've been really lucky to have the NHS X team, who are a team of very clever people used to looking at digital tools. So they've been incredibly helpful in moving this on. So I'll hand over to Lisa now just to talk a little bit more about the, the actual progress to date. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Alison. And hi, everybody. Um, so once that um, I Decide acronym um, was sort of born or established, um, we were really keen to start testing and um, seeing sort of how it went down with, with people who use maternity services and people who provide maternity services. And so we went and tested the concept um, in partnership with Birthrights um, at two um, maternity units, one in Liverpool and one in Essex and had some really fantastic feedback from both women and partners who had recently had experiences of maternity services where they had needed to make decisions during their labour and birth experience, but also from um, a range of clinicians. So we had um, a range of different midwives, along with anaesthetists and um, registrars and obstetri obstetricians who joined us to um, test the I Decide concept. Um, following that um, testing process, um, a national I Decide multidisciplinary steering group was established um, and headed up and sits as part of the Maternity Transformation Programme at NHS England and NHS Improvement. And um, a co-produced strategy for development of I Decide was um, agreed with these very three key um, and clear objectives. So. We got to the point of establishing that actually um, developing some sort of tool would be really useful um, and um, with the world going digital it felt like if we can make this digital from the start that potentially would be um, hugely beneficial. Um, we were really keen for women and birthing people to be able to access um, really uh, evidence-based, co-produced, up-to-date, easily accessible information, um, both during labour if there is time for them to access that, but also um, ideally antenatally where there's much more time to process information, to think about information in light of a possibly a previous birth experience and to think ahead of time about possible choices um, that a woman might need to make. And finally, some um, training for clinicians um, around Montgomery, uh, the GMC consent guidance that's just recently been re revised, and the basis for I Decide and um, supporting women to make their own informed decisions and supporting them in their decisions. Um, so then at the start of this year, just before we found ourselves in the midst of a pandemic, um, we connected with NHS X and a digital discovery was launched with uh, clinicians and women. Thanks, Alison. And um, certainly what they found in their initial findings was um, really helpful to us and um, really interesting the correlation between what women and birthing people were saying and what clinicians were saying so women here were saying you know I need one NHS end to end I need to feel prepared and be prepared um, information that I can trust and understand and it definitely came through that um, you know NHS branding of information um, was something that was um, requested and, and trusted um, I need to be able to access my information. So like Alison talked about a personalised care and support plan, women want to be able to access that antenatally and um, be in control of it. Um, and of course, to be listened to. So that um, I, I, a woman can trust that all her needs are going to be met. Um, she feels safe, um, even if plans need to change during a labour and birth experience. Um, feeling prepared does have some impact on how safe and secure a woman feels about a possible change of plans. Um, interesting that we followed Andrew around communication, so um, wanting access to information that, that um, means communication is not an issue. 
um, being able to make uh, your own wishes known. Oh, sorry, Ali, do you mind just nipping back? Apologies, yeah. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I just didn't see that last point. Um, and yes, and being listened to absolutely that, that a woman's wishes are um, addressed, um, not just that she gets to say what what's important to her and material to her, but actually um, that those things are listened to. Thanks, Alison. So really interesting that um, we found some real connection with what clinicians were saying as well from a potential um, digital tool to support decision making and consent um, during labour and birth. So again, that whole one NHS end to end so that um, the clinician has a 360 degree view of the person and again impacted hugely by continuity of carer, both for midwives and obstetricians. Um, consent that's fit for purpose so um, being able to focus on what's important rather than um, sort of administration of forms etc but making sure that women understand what giving consent means and the responsibility of making it their own informed decisions um, the real need for factual neutral information um, but also a need for that information to then be um, in the hands of the clinician to be able to communicate that to women in a personalised way. So um, potentially some very generic information about possible in interventions, but the personalisation of that information to be done by the person caring for the woman in light of her specific um, circumstances. Um, confidence in the profession's concerns being addressed and we've picked this up a lot throughout the project um, seeing risks to clinicians being managed and tools that support the clinician's role so we absolutely did not want to and continue to not want to create anything that is going to um, create additional work or take more time for clinicians particularly as we know um, in labour which can be fast paced and high stress etc and it's worth mentioning that at the start of the IDSI project or very early on we did think as a steering group would it be better for us to develop a, a, a decision making tool for another time in the maternity journey so potentially that could be used during pregnancy for making a decision about for example where a woman might choose to birth her baby or plans to choose to birth her baby be, um, that, which could then be um, converted almost for um, for a labour situation and we unanimously felt if we can make it work for labour it'll work for any other scenario that, that doesn't have the, 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 the same feel and, and potential constraints as labour. Okay, so just coming to um, <clears throat> future plans now, um, I should say actually that we've just put out a survey, so thank you to Susie and Bix for sharing that. Um, it will come out via the college as well. Um, really, it takes five minutes and it's for obstetricians to just look at what we might think of a digital tool, but also what we might think about electronic records um, at all. So interesting, this has been done by midwives and by women. And I'm sure you can predict some of the answers about not being able to log in, how long it takes us to find a computer that works, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's really important, I think, that we have that background information. So that's just going on um, as we speak. Um, Badgenet are the company who um, volunteered basically to, to test feasibility. We were quite keen to have a range of servers, um, but as it happened, Badgenet volunteered and, and we didn't have any other volunteers at the time. Um, the aim is certainly that it will be for use in with all different servers but for now for the feasibility um, it, it had to be in units that were already using Badgenet. The, the advantage is, um, I don't know how many of you on the call use Badgenet, I'd be interested to hear that, 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 that there is a, an app that the woman can use on her journey in pregnancy so it lends itself quite nicely. We're going to be doing four more pilots next year um, and probably 10 to 12 units. We will need to look very carefully about the range there geographically and size, etc., as well as with a range of different digital servers. And then, of course, 
ultimately we're hoping that this will be um, a reality in all maternity units but we have a lot of work to do before then which we recognize not only in terms of the digitalization of the tool making sure that we've all got laptops etc on labor wards which is going to be a feat in itself but also almost more difficult actually um, is the co-producing of information so we've chosen four things um, cesarean birth, assisted vaginal delivery, fetal monitoring and recommendation of augmentation after spontaneous rupture of membranes. So those are going to be the four um, and we chose them because we thought, hoped that they were relatively easy for us to put together some information evidence-based but it's amazing um, how different everybody speaks to women about these things. So I think that's one of the most interesting things of the project that to have some consensus, which we will get, um, has been quite interesting just in terms of what are the key things that all women need to know about these recommended interventions. But the main point, as I said, means that antenatally a woman will be more prepared by the time she's confronted with an offer or recommendation or one of those interventions in labour. So I think we'll finish there if that's okay. Um, so we've, we've tried to make it fairly short and sweet because there may well be questions which we're very happy to take. Thank you. Thank you so much Ali and Lisa that was really fantastic and I think it's a really interesting piece of work and as you said kind of we you know following on from Andrew's talk we know how damaging language can be if used inappropriately and how important it is for women um, to uh, feel as though they've been involved and not coerced into decisions and I think this this is going to be so important and we've got one question here and um, I don't know if anybody else has any questions that they want to put on the chat but this question is about um, the information that's going to be used and whether or not you're going to be drawing from existing sources for example the RCOG patient information leaflets or whether or not it's going to be new text and if it is the latter is it ready to be shared or where can people find it? Uh, not quite ready to be shared, <laughs> still still in development. Um, Lisa, do you want to say any more about the detail of that? Um, yeah, happy to. Thanks, Alison. So we are hoping to co-produce. Um, we absolutely will um, build on and use anything that's already in existence that's up to date and evidence based. And ideally, we're looking for um, information uh, re regarding those four inter possible interventions that Alison mentioned uh, to be available to women in a variety of languages and in a variety of formats so um, absolutely we are hoping for information in written format also um, in uh, visual so using hopefully icon arrays and we have been really fortunate to connect with the Winton Centre for Risk Communication in Cambridge who are going to be supporting us with um, with this part of the project uh, but also ideally some short videos as well um, either of clinicians talking about each of those possible interventions but also possibly with um, uh, women birthing people and their partners talking a little bit about um, a previous experience and of course though all of this information ideally is available will be available to women and birthing people uh, during pregnancy and only access during um, a labour situation of course where there is time to do so. Great, thank you. Uh, one other question to both of you which is uh, do you think knowledge of risks raises anxiety amongst women if we're talking about risks of women antenatally? Shall I go first again Lisa? That's all right. Um, <laughs> I suppose, my, my response would be information is power knowledge is power so if women don't want to know that's absolutely fine they don't need to know but if if they do want to know let's make it easy for them to access information yeah i think i just um referenced the oac care bundle i know that has been controversial in in some ways but i think it's really interesting so fifty-seven thousand women um were told or, or dis had discussed in their antenatal period about perineal trauma and what they could do to prevent it and just giving them more information um, and there were very very few who did not want to know so so the overwhelming finding in that sense was that women prefer to know um, about what might happen to them and all the stakeholders that we've spoken to um, are absolutely agreeing with that. Now, of course, there will be some women who don't want to, and, and of course, that's their right, but we're hearing that the majority would, the vast majority would 
prefer to be prepared and at least have the opportunity to have those conversations um, before it's an emergency at four o'clock in the morning. Absolutely, and I think the importance of the evidence base from which um, those uh, that information comes is just so important, isn't there, in, this, in the modern age of fake news and algorithms and what everybody can click on. Um, one more question and we'll move on, which is a question about uh, overlap with the old Witch Birth Choices website and whether or not it will overlap. I'm happy to come in, Alison. So um, this is something that we um, at NHS England have um, are, are obviously aware of. Um, there is some potential work around um, uh, making some of the information that used to be available on the Witch um, Birth Choices website available to women. I don't think there'll be direct overlap because um, this, I think, is much more specific at the moment to um, a labour and birth scenario and um, the first iteration of I Decide, but um, worth raising, so thank you. Great. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. If anybody else has any other questions, we will have hopefully some time at the end. Thank you so much. We're going to move on next to uh, Mary Adams, who's going to talk to us about the DISCERN study. Um, while Mary switches things on and uploads her presentation, uh, just to give you a bit of background around Mary, about Mary, she's a senior research fellow at King's College London and is a social and medical anthropologist and a midwife. Are you there, Mary? Hello, yes, I'm here. I'm just checking where my Thank you so much. is, which was there previously. <laughs> it's all right, don't worry. Fine. I think everybody's well used to yes. these formats. What? Is it up now? Mm. Not yet. No. Mm. I can't see even how to come out of where I'm in. can't see that. No, that's not coming up yet. <laughs> it was working perfectly earlier, wasn't it? It was, it was. Isn't that the way? Anyway, it's always the way. I'll get that down now, though. Mm. Yeah, I I'm not sure how to um, solve this. I want to get up for me, Mary. back to me while I fiddle about. That's fine. That's fine. Let me see if I can get it up for you quickly. I'm sorry, I can't get it up. That's okay. Don't worry. I'm seeing if I can get it up here for you. Hang on oh. a second. Okay. I'll just. Got it now. No, no, I've got. Oh. One second. I've got. I've got it up. Can people see that? Oh. Yeah, that's great, Susie. We can see that. Great. great. There we go. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So, thank you for your patience, everyone. Just to introduce the DISCERN study and tell you where we are with our research. The DISCERN study is NIH off, an NIHR-funded study, and it's essentially looking at how... Um, it's looking at how to improve communication, conversations, behaviours, information giving when something goes wrong in maternity care. And we're defining that going wrong quite broadly. So from a severe incident to something that might come up a fair bit later to a woman in terms of her, how she feels psychologically. 
Um, our study team is there. You should be able to see them. Um, no, I've just got to be able to move on. That's fine. Um, I'll, I'll, think I'll move on for you, Mary. I, oh, there's going to be a lot of clicks, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> right, okay. So the point of our study is to generate usable findings and use primary research to co-produce with stakeholders. You're going to have to click a lot, so I'm afraid. Okay. Click <laughs> And again, please, Susie, thank you. Um, to co-produce materials um, for frontline staff, so clinicians, midwives and administrators and women and families, and to offer practical re recommendations to NHS um, organisations and trusts. And could you click again, please? Um, to offer a realist approach, looking at what works for who in what circumstances and why and to what consequences. And what we're basically doing is looking at the really essential factors that are going to help any sort of improvement in this area. Um, next slide, please. So what we know, what, well, the issue that we began with really, could you click, please? Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but from, from these, um, and, and things are improving, but as you can see from this data, there are um, a significant number of families that aren't notified when a serious incident happens and um, fewer families are involved in reviews or sometimes even informed that a review is happening. And that's quite marked, particularly, um, or was quite marked in reviews of severe maternal harm. Um, could you click again, please? And what struck us really was the gap between what women and families wanted in terms of conversations and the sorts of engagements that happened when harm ha had happened to them and what clinicians felt they were actually delivering. And this is sort of an international finding and it's not limited to maternity. Um, next slide, please. So the key propositions that really um, shaped our, our study are the idea that being candid, being honest about what's happened, including saying we really don't know what's happened yet, is about good interpersonal communication, but it's also about an organisational culture uh, that supports this communication as standard practice. And um, that disclosure processes, and we'll talk about whether they're one-off conversations or not in a minute, need to be sort of situated in really, as really structured, quite multifaceted initiatives that happen within organisations. They're not about a one, just a one-to-one -one relationship uh, between a clinician and a woman. There's a lot of background stuff and a lot of concerns going on, if you like, surrounding those conversations. Another thing that really came out of all the material we looked at was an urgent need for staff training and this has been called for again and again um, but we're still not really clear what sort of training is most effective for supporting um, uh, clinicians to learn how to communicate with families in these difficult situations and there's also a repeated call for the support of staff, uh, our women and families and clinicians, um, dealing with the emotional consequences of serious incidents, but also the effects of the disclosure, those disclosure conversations might have on everyone if they don't quite go as expected. Next slide, please. Um, so our study is divided into three phases and clearly with this year our phases are slightly confused. So we're doing a literature review and stakeholder consultations and I, we're identifying up to four sites. We have them identified now and we're aiming to work, do um, ethnographic work, which will just be starting quite soon now, we hope, fingers crossed, doing observational work, uh, sitting in on meetings doing some in-depth interviews and some documentary analysis in some high performing areas because what we want to learn is how to get the best out of what are really challenging situations. What does it take to improve? What does it take to embed improvements? And our final phase is to um, have some interpretive forums where we can contextualize and translate our findings with a, a wider range of uh, people from other trusts and services 
and to um, co-produce guidance with women, families and maternity care teams. Next slide, please. So our review of the literature um, really um, struck us as um, a, one really important difference in this review was the difference between work as imagined and that, that doesn't mean to say it's not important this work but it's it's different to work as done so the work as imagined the policy and the managerial efforts to organize and to fund and to improve service services we've sort of particularly in the past year or so there's been extraordinary investment in um maternity safety improvement but also involving women and families in those improvements and then the marked difference between work as done you know the care that's actually delivered to patients and um uh, from from looking at uh current previous current studies we're finding that you know a lot of this work is done is working on discretionary effort and goodwill uh, rather than really being um part of um ongoing recognized time given for these discussions um next section please thank you um we also found for, oh could you go back there we um, thanks um, we also found that there was really limited knowledge of what family and women and family really, how they experience disclosure conversations, how they experience um, um, uh, difficult conversations about harm that's happened to them. And there's limited understanding of how improvements can be made. It's as if everyone knows what would be good, what may be good, but, and I'll, I'll return to that in a minute, but it's quite about how to get there and how to sustain it seems to be the most challenging thing. Um, we also found, um, but this is really changing now, uh, limited sharing between senior stakeholders um, across and within provider organisations. And there, there's a, been a, a really huge effort to change that, which might um, then help clarity around when families are involved when they're notified who's supporting them which agencies are, are are responsible for that at different times and we've also found there's quite a limited consideration of the resources required for effective disclosure work particularly the um with internal reviews to the perinatal mortality review tool um, the sort of the, 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 the demands for uh, on staff time is quite significant um, and is a pressure for, for services. Next slide, please. Sorry, there's going to be a bit of, a bit of clicking at this one. I, I'm sorry. Um, the, the, um, we, I, just to give you an idea of where we're up to, um, with our literature review and our co-investigator discussions are there, there on the left hand side of the screen and then we've just finished uh, what we're still continuing um, around 50 interviews um, asking the, our interviewees and that ranged from 16 um, families um, to barristers, anaesthetists, midwives, um, senior clinicians um, to ask them to help us refine those findings and, and to sort of really drill down what the issues were for them, what were the keys to improving. So first click, please. Um, so we found in the literature there was some, what was often highlighted was this rather magnified moment when somebody goes in, often at the end of, of, uh, of uh, before a woman moves from the labor, sweet and says you know, we think something's really gone wrong here and we also found that there was a, a, a real emphasis on the need for staff to have good disclosure conversations could you click please twice and then we found that um, really when we talk to families um, this disclosure and being candid was often um, wasn't quite so straightforward. I mean, there were, it was quite an unpredictable process, a series of events that wasn't simply around, we're, we're waiting to discuss the instant report with you. It was around a general sensitivity to um, a family's feelings at that time. So a clinician might leave um, a, a room feeling that they've done 
you know, a, had a really careful conversation and walked past a relative in the corridor who and not offered them a chair. And that is the thing that when the family is sort of getting this all together afterwards, it feels so hurtful that somebody was left out or somebody who was wasn't part of that conversation was felt forgotten so these are are, are really challenging times i feel um for for um that are more than a one more than a conversation um, um so next um thank you coordination of care for families are uh, it was also really um uh, a key area and that's been highlighted again could you click twice, please? Thank you. Um, and uh, this looks as if it might be addressed now by um, the introduction of patient navigation systems that are slowly being developed. And, and we're really interested in seeing how they will go if families feel supported um, through um, and have um, tailored information for them as they move through this um, process of being told and then wanting to find out what's going to happen next, what the conclusions to investigations are. Um, next, if you could click three times, please, it might be easier. Um, the issue of tailored advice and advocacy for families and staff involved, um, it, it seems that the uh, having responsive systems for staff to seek advice and for family advocacy seems really um, significant here. And, and, and what we're finding is that families are, are, are um, uh, relying on bereavement midwives, and that's part of that work, but clearly, you know, that is a, um, a, a precious resource. And also they're relying on claims lawyers who often become their advocates because these are the people who have more interaction with them and are more supportive of them they feel than many of the clinical staff um, because at, by that point in time often clinicians are told now you can no longer have any contact with that family and it be can become quite adversarial um, could you click three times please thank you um, we looked at strategies you our review and our, our initial discussions were about strategies and techniques for working across boundaries and we really felt initially that this was around professional boundaries um, who was going to organize the um, the meeting um, was it going to involve the neonatal team um, how did it work between the midwives and the obstetricians and uh, and it, it seemed to be that seemed to be the frame and then when we started doing our interviews um, this rolled out to be something far more complicated the, the really wide range of personnel who have to be drawn into any improvement in this area and, and that sort of went from PALS to complaints teams to the patient experience team the trust legal team were really significant in this the sorts of um, relationships that that senior clinicians have with those with that team how quickly those staff turn over you know if any um if the legal team even has time to reflect on how improvements could how communication could be improved um with with the maternity team seems quite significant at the moment um three more clicks please there's also also what came up quite early is the is the, the the need for or the capacity for everyone to be able to cope with the grey with the uncertainty of what has happened something's gone wrong how are we going to ever figure out what that is do we wait and during that time the um, distrust that can develop um, for families um, and um, someone we interviewed summarized this quite well as as you know it, it, it's it's not simply a gray it's that there are, are many lenses are brought to bear on the frameworks for understanding what's happened so this the human factors approach there's also um uh is it less reasonable the questions of reasonable care questions of whether you know direct causality can be established and when all of these um discussions are happening these debates are happening um it's families uh, uh and women are, are 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 really um raising questions about how reliable this is is this trustworthy what's happened where where is 
information that seemed quite straightforward to us. Where is it, where is it gone? Who, who's, who's doing what to it? Three more clicks, please. And finally, the, um, the issue of including um, affected families' experiences into a bigger picture of learning for improvement. Um, and then considering what inclusion means, um, and it really does vary um, across where, when we've been interviewing people and also you know, in the literature. You know, is it about just informing people about what happened? Is it asking for their views? Is it spending more time asking for an account in their terms? Or is it even asking them which, what are the most appropriate questions to ask? Um, and this is more than drawing up an agenda for a meeting. This is really about asking what is significant for you in terms of learning and then identifying the, that as, as a way of, of, of um, informing safety improvement. Next slide, please. So just thinking about where we're at now with uh, thinking about safe communication, sort of structures, behavior and experience. Um, first click, please. Um, we've sort of been thinking about disclosure conversations and what they, what they require as reflective and reflexive learning. Um, the uh, moment by moment dealing with quite difficult interactions as situations unfold, quite often unpredictable situations of people are told something's gone wrong, we don't know why, or we think, you know, there's been an error here. Um, and thinking about how people learn those skills from what we're finding is the odd person in a in a um in a service who's who's um somehow is considered quite and probably is skilled at this ends up leading this uh and we're thinking about how that learning happens you know if there's any um, if we can think about this in terms of apprenticeship training, you know, how role modelling happens, how things are felt and how this craft of, 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 um, of anticipating what a good conversation feels like for a family, how that looks. Next click, next bubble, please. Um, and uh, we're thinking about communication and, uh, in this now, just starting to as risk and we're using Amy Edmondson's work looking at psychological safety and, and what it means to, to, to take a risk and feel, feel that that's a risk that is worth taking is to be quite honest and transparent as you can be with a family and probably with colleagues and something that's come up in our literature that is that um, clinical teams have to feel confident that um, quality and safety improvement processes are then going to be worth that risk for everyone as well as the, the um as well as um it being an immediate conversation that the, the, the risk sort of comes forward into um informing uh, safety improvements next um click please um and we're starting to think about disclosure practices in the NHS as always risky. Primary care legislation, a whole variety of ways, discourages openness. And we're trying to track that through, through looking at what is and isn't available to staff, what isn't, isn't available to families as, uh, as investigations happen. And also, to be, we're trying to look at how teams and organizations build memories um, of what's safe, who, who you risk things with, who, who you really can tell what went wrong to. And final um, bubble, please. And that uh, using Amy Evanson's work, we're sort of thinking that conversations like this are more likely to be risked. So more, more detailed, more, more um, perhaps even saying, we don't know yet, when leaders Sort of set a stage when they welcome bad news, not good, news, not only good news, and when participation is invited, and that that means a different sort of idea that that authority can be questioned, and that there's that um, leaders can respond productively, and and um, destigmatize failure and equally sanction um, clear violations. Next slide, please. So. So far with the DISCERN project, um, next, thank you. So we're getting some idea of what 
good looks like for families, for staff and services. And for families, at least, you know, I felt a, a, a sincere apology. Good heavens, does that really make a difference? And that can happen almost a year after people have been struggling to um, just be recognised. Um, also, honesty, even if people say they don't know or they think something um, has gone wrong and that um, it's complex, they don't know yet, and it's going to take a long while to find out. Um, and one of our co-investigators spoke this week about women being trapped in a damaging cycle of always seeking answers because um, there is a, a, a reluctance to even discuss um, um, a, an incident of harm. Um, and, uh, oh, I can't see this. I think that, I'm sorry, I can't see that. So I'm going to, um, yeah. I think the, the um, final um, comment as well that, that was brought up is that, um, Disclosure should be part of good clinical care. And um, what our, um, the same co-investigators said this week, and she wanted this mentioned, that no good doctor or midwife would leave a physical wound unstitched, but the psychological injury from a lack of candor isn't seen in, in the same way. And I think it's, it's that sort of emphasis that um, women and families and, and their representatives are bringing to this project. But equally, if you could just give a final click, please. Um, that this disclosure work just can't be developed and sustained within, without, without a buy-in from a multitude of different interest groups. And that is legal teams, campaigners, practice supervisors and heads of service. Um, next slide, please. So thank you. Uh, we're still interviewing. So if anyone is interested, we're really looking for, we would really like to talk to some risk midwives at the moment and some clinical leads. So we're contactable at the bottom. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the technological difficulties. Well, I'm so sorry. I'm sure it was down to me, Susie. <laughs> Very good. We've got a few questions for you. Sure. Um, one of the first question was around whether or not some of this work will overlap into HCM involvement in trusts and maternity uh, quality teams. Yes, it certainly will. Um, we are, um, we're, there is another team working in Leeds who are, who are working directly with the HCIV improvements. Um, so we're in contact with them because they're also an NI, N, NH, NIHR research study. Um, and we're also, we've interviewed, I think, um, about eight HCIV um, staff now, and we will be um, carrying on with our involvement with them. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, somebody said that, she, that they think that actually some of this was, there is there are some improvements, and whether or not you feel as though you are starting to see some improvements. Um, yes, yes, there are. I I think there's like oh, probably like the maternity safety agenda generally. Um, there's huge variation, um, and um, I think that's worth understanding. I I think that we can learn from those improvements, and that the point of the project really yeah thank you in those areas thank you um and i suppose for me i it really it was around what we think we can really do because as we said i think what we're not very good at is defining what good is or haven't been before and that's the value of this isn't it mm -hmm. um but then really how we're going to provide that training because often these are the things thinking about it from the point of view as an obstetrician um who has been a clinical lead and has had many of these conversations most people don't get involved with these things certainly as a trainee obstetrician and therefore get, kind of get put into jobs and therefore and then pick it up and really what you think we should be doing to train midwives and obstetricians about these things a bit earlier really yes we've i think we've got to think about that i mean uh, there seems to be a lot of training available for um most in a one-off way um for um risk midwives and um uh one day courses this sort of thing or the yes that seems to be how it's happening at the moment mm -hmm. and we're trying to think about role modeling how that help how how that's possible actually mm -hmm. uh, and the development of those skills mm -hmm. um 
because it, it clearly falls to someone quite senior, but then how do those skills become developed, I think, is a, is a, is a question for us. Mm. That's really good. Thank you. One last question, and we're going to move on, which is, um, is HCIP helping to reduce the variations that are seen between, between trusts with regards to disclosure and duty of candour? Do, do you think that variation is changing, or do you think that there is still variation? Um, I'm not sure. To be honest, I mean, we we haven't surveyed every trust. Mm. I think um, the, my impression from talking to people who are working in the HCIP teams, there's um, they're re they're really working very hard to um, engage with um, with services and um, um, with particular individuals within services. And I think what's often overlooked with the HCIP work is the amount of uh, relational work that goes on between the HCIP um, area leads and the different trusts. And building those relationships takes a while. And I think that some of them are doing that really well. And I just, I just think that that takes time. Mm. No, I think you're right. And I think obviously, you know, these are whole new processes and everybody's mm. working out the best way of, of creating those relationships and, and making things work differently, aren't they? So, mm. and I'm sure there's some really good um, examples of that up and down the country that'll be really interesting to come out of this. So, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. That's fantastic. And um, we're going to move on to our final speaker. Uh, who I will, who hopefully will be able to get the presentation up. I'm going to hand over to Claire Murphy. Um, are you there, Claire? Yes, and Claire is starting to screen share. So Claire is Deputy CEO at BPAS and Principal Investigator at the Risk Project, and she's going to be talking to us about risk communication in pregnancy, understanding women's values and needs. Thank you so much, Claire. Thanks so much for having me. Um, can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, I've really enjoyed the presentations this evening. They've been absolutely fascinating and very much tie into the work we've been doing. And what I hope to do with this last presentation is to look at how some of the issues that we've recognised in intrapartum risk communication fit into the, the broader landscape, if you like, of where the issues are um, with uh, risk communication uh, in, in, in pregnancy more generally. Um, so yeah, so I'm from BPAS. I'm just going to start off telling you a little bit about BPAS and why we got involved in this particular area. So we're a nationwide charity. We provide counselling around um, unplanned pregnancy, abortion services, miscarriage management and contraceptive care to about 90,000 women. And part of our charitable remit is also to advocate uh, on behalf of, of women's reproductive choice. And I suppose we got interested in this you know we come to this from a perspective of unplanned pregnancy being a, a, a fact of life and really feeling sometimes that we're on the we're on the sort of sharp end if you like of where risk communication goes wrong um so you know if unplanned pregnancy is a fact of life contraception fails sometimes we fail to use it properly lots of pregnancies in this country are unplanned um but unplanned isn't synonymous with unwanted so lots of women will have um uh, for example drunk alcohol before finding out they were pregnant um, and the sort of precautionary principle which underpins a lot of um, risk messaging in, in pregnancy can really have a very detrimental effect on, on some women um, and also we see women who've been told to avoid all medicines in, in pregnancy for example you know women suffering quite severe pregnancy sickness who have told to avoid all medicines because no medication can be used in pregnancy um, and yeah, you know, and ultimately get so ill that they're left with no choice um, but to, to end the pregnancy. We also see women for whom, you know, we've talked about some of the issues around birth trauma and where communication is sometimes a central issue rather than the actual physical experience. Uh, and for women who simply can't go on to have another pregnancy uh, after what they'd experienced uh, in, a, in a previous one. So, you know, we, we felt there were some issues with how risk was being communicated more generally. We uh, brought together a group of stakeholders a couple of years ago to work out whether some of our sense of, of how this was playing out was shared. Um, this was clinicians, midwives, obstetricians, uh, women's health uh, advocates and pregnant women themselves um, to really sort of hammer out whether there was any consensus on this. Um, 
And these are some of the key concerns that were raised um, that, you know, a sense that we kind of had this culture of blame where women themselves often felt accountable um, when things went wrong, um, the issues with the, the, the idea of the precautionary principle always um, underpinning all um, pregnancy risk messaging um, and a very individualized understanding of choice and women, you know, feeling that they couldn't always act on the messages um, uh, they were given, a focus on the fetus, um, sometimes to the expense of maternal well-being, uh, and that going hand in hand with um, increased surveillance and the use of technologies um, in pregnancy, for example, carbon monoxide um, uh, testing. Um, so we um, were then funded by the Wellcome Trust um, to put together this project. It's a collaboration between BPAS um, and um, Cardiff University um, with a uh, remit to explore and map some of the current issues in risk communication. I'm sorry, the kids looking forward. Uh, and to develop um, to, and to really try and surface women's experiences and to try and develop um, some recommendations on how we could improve. Um, women's uh, experience uh, and we have um, let's say it's a, it's a collaboration with plenty of support from um, women's advocacy groups and um, academics at a number of universities um, and we start from the basis that risk communication isn't just around pregnancy isn't just focused on pregnant women it's something that increasingly affects women across their reproductive lifetimes particularly as we increasingly see medications for example being denied um, to any woman with a of, of reproductive age uh, on the basis of her capacity to get um, pregnant um, so I'm going to start off by when we looked at mapping the landscape, one of the key areas we wanted to look at actually was a sort of cultural environment in which risk is communicated um, around pregnancy. And one of the issues that had been initially raised at our um, stakeholder meeting was very much the sense that this climate of sort of scrutiny and, and surveillance and heightened risk was very much amplified by the media and that the media were perhaps themselves culpable um, in, in this. Um, you know, we recognise the media as an important source of risk messaging around fertility and, and pregnancy. And as I say, you know, this, this had been identified as, as an area uh, of, of concern. Um, so we set out to understand, understand the landscape, to describe the breadth and volume and frequency and content of stories in the media relating to fertility uh, or pregnancy uh, over selected time periods. And we looked at how uh, reliable they were. Um, and, I, and I suppose this is sort of how we viewed the risk reporting pathway, if you like, that decisions are made about what research is going to get funded. Um, then the researcher picks that up, um, you know, the study is produced, the press release um, uh, uh, is produced, the headlines come, um, and then the health and then health messages and uh, are received by, by women and those around them. Um, so we found um, we, this was a, we, we took four months um, over 2018 and 2019, completely randomly picked, um, and we found uh, 56 um, unique uh, pregnancy related risk stories had been covered uh, in those months. Um, and I think what was really interesting is that the focus was absolutely on the mother, um, or, you know, or very largely the focus was on the mother as the source of risk and the offspring um, was, was studied as the outcome of, of interest. Um, so effectively uh, with fathers not really getting so much of a, of a look in um, and uh, mother's own morbidity uh, also pretty far down the pecking uh, order. Um, these were the stories, the topics um, that were um, most covered. So food and drink and nutrition, those were sort of the, the real kind of staple fare, if you like, of media uh, coverage. But medicines, um, sorry, my slides keep looking forward. Um, but medicines and medical interventions and particularly issues around birthing decisions um, and, and choices uh, women make um, during labor and, and childbirth were also pretty high up. 
um, and again with this focus on you know the choice the choice of the woman and the outcome for the for the for the pregnancy rather than necessarily for her um, here it's it, you know one of the stories um, we looked at in some depth was one which looked at the relationship between um, and which got a huge amount of coverage the relationship between cesarean delivery um, and autism stroke um, ADHD um, and then actually this one was was one from more recently but but again a, a choice around birth um, and the use of pain relief uh, and the impact um, on on the, the the offspring as a result um, and you know I have to say with both of these stories the absolute failure to contextualize risk um, and ab, you know an absolute risk and, and relative risk was 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 absolutely um, uh, paramount um, so, you know we very much concluded that the media landscape was absolutely a rich and frequent source of, of risk me messages it was woman-centric when it came to risk factors but offspring centric when it came to outcomes and women's bodies were seen as kind of inherently risky a real failure across the piece to contextualize um, risk but that it wasn't abs actually the media themselves that were always at fault with this and that often um, the, the the initial the, the issues were very much present in the research itself and the way the research was written and and oftentimes it felt the research had almost been written up and certainly press released in a way to achieve this maximum um, um, impact and that you know largely reporters were re reporting study findings um, uh, largely as, as they'd been reported um, in, in the studies themselves. So the focus of research, or certainly research that met the public domain, was very much about how women's choices impacted upon offspring. So then we wanted to look at how do women experience um, this, this landscape. Um, uh, we conducted a nationwide survey, it was completed by 7,000 women um, looking at um, th their attitudes uh, towards risk and experiences of risk communication in pregnancy. These were women who were either pregnant or had been pregnant in the, um, the given birth in the last five years. Um, and then we sampled um, uh, 40 of those women to conduct um, in depth. Um, interviews uh, and we did do some purposive sampling so for example we we recognize that things like medication use and high BMI um, that those were likely to be women who had a very particular experience of risk communication um, and so we, we looked to sample them I think what was really interesting is that actually we found quite broad acceptance and support for the precautionary principle uh, among women, that women accepted that this was that that there was a different approach to risk communication in pregnancy than to other um, uh, how health was communicated elsewhere during one's lifetime, but that people didn't necessarily see any contradiction between the the precautionary principle approach, the sort of do don't top, quite top level advice. And then a kind of more granular, actually also giving people access to the evidence that underpin that. And of course, the paucity sometimes of the evidence which underpins the precautionary principle. Um, and what women want to see actually was more openness about the, the, what the precautionary principle actually meant. You know, I think better safe than sorry approach is fine if it's explained to people and partners expecting a baby that this is the basis on which the advice is given. I'm so sorry about my slides. Um, this, this desire that, you know, I think has also come through in the I Decide project um, about, you know, getting access to more information to enable women to weigh up, um, risk themselves and make their own decisions. And a recognition that that we all have different risk appetites and that actually what might be what might be my level of risk might not be someone else's and that that will be determined by our own reproductive uh, experiences so this is a woman who'd had I'd had repeat miscarriages my threshold for what is an unacceptable risk drinking exercise smoking medication is very low however I know that many things I wouldn't consider acceptable for me uh, are perfectly compatible with a healthy pregnancy. 
And so I think, you know, we sort of paint this picture of, of the sea in which women swim, um, if you like, and, and the way in which some of these attitudes can often make women feel very surveyed, particularly if they're in, you know, women talked about being in a public place where, you know, in a pub or the chance would obviously be a fine thing these days. Um, but, you know, feeling how, how the precautionary principle kind of underpinned actually their experience of being pregnant outside of antenatal sessions as well. Um, and also increasingly feeling surveyed by their own partners. So messages around caffeine, for example. Um, this was a woman whose husband was very worried about it and started almost sort of policing her intake of Coca-Cola. Um, and then, yeah, and how the precautionary principle then sort of comes into antenatal care. So where you, well, you know, I think particularly with the issues like carbon monoxide testing, where we've got to a point where actually a woman's word as to whether she smokes is that the risk is now seen so great that women can't necessarily be trusted to tell the truth on, on, on this front. And, and the way in which that, that sort of sets the stage for how women interact with healthcare professionals. Uh, and this was one of our interviewees reflecting on how she felt it really created a power imbalance, um, really sort of straight off the bat. One of the key themes we found was the impact of the, the sources of frustration for women were really sometimes the, you know, the impact of the inability to act on risk information that they'd received. So particularly around, um, which of course gets a lot of coverage now, you know, the impact of stress on pregnancy, um, you know, and feeling, yes, I was told about this all the time, the, the impact of, of stress, anxiety, depression on the baby, but not knowing how to manage it. Um, being overweight, I'm going to talk specifically in a couple of minutes about how the, the particular experience of women with, with high BMIs, um, but that coming into pregnancy overweight and being perpetually told um, of the risk that she was posing to her baby, but but not having she was she was already pregnant, not having any any means to do anything about that. Um, I, I've already referenced, you know, how some of the the drinking messages can can play out um, for women, particularly those who who've had an episode of binge drinking before they found out they were pregnant. And then I think we see this mismatch as well between the information women want um, and the information um, that, that they or, or would have wanted in retrospect and, and the information that they received. So, you know, women felt they got a lot of information on smoking and drinking, very little on issues like managing stress um, and mental health. And then this is one relating to um, to birth issues and you know having really not very felt well prepared for quite serious um, tearing that that hadn't been something that was discussed um, in the antenatal period. Um, and actually, when we looked at the issues that women felt were well explained to them during the antenatal period, yeah, food and drink, alcohol, smoking, those those have you know those are done very well women felt they got a lot of information on those but actually as it, it, it came out in 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 many of, of of the women we spoke to things like managing mental health and stress um very high up on women's agendas and but that didn't that women didn't feel that that was particularly well um addressed and actually this was this sort of priority area was was identified very recently in a um, a piece of work looking at um, what research priorities should should be and actually you know there is this you know all stakeholders agree that issues like mental health and birth experiences really need to be very high up uh, on the on the research agenda um, in terms of how women felt information was communicated to them there was a sense that this was sometimes delivered in a partial way to deliver a particular result um, so how we think, you know, we may think of the risk of stillbirth as being 2% as being high, but for that woman, she felt like knowing that it was 2% might have made, she might have made a different decision about her birth as a result. Um, again, I think, this, you know, this is a woman who was potentially told her risk of stillbirth was 50% higher. Um, but, she, you know, she felt, she felt statistics were, were used to make her go down a, a particular sort of childbirth. Um, and again, uh, a feeling that she would, she'd been talked, statistics had been used to talk her out of a particular birth method that she would have felt more comfortable with. Um, very quickly now, I just want to talk about the experience of women with higher BMIs because I think these are women for whom the 
the experience is actually particularly negative. These are women who we, I feel think we see increasingly in, in the news um, covered by, you know, um, messages, but, um, but, you know, we don't necessarily always hear how their voices play out. Um, as I mentioned before, lot, for lots of women, um, it was feeling that they'd actually, they, they were still overweight, but they'd lost weight to come into pregnancy, but that was never, never recognized, still felt chastised, um, that they were causing their fetus harm. The, the, the real fundamental thing that came through with all the women we spoke to was this sense of real dehumanization. Um, that they felt like a lesser person, they felt like they were a number on a scale, perpetually told that they were uh, at a big, uh, that they were a big risk to their baby. Um, you know, think we need to think about how we sit, we're setting these women up on the path to to, to motherhood. Um, this woman talked about being being spoken about as a manual handling risk right in right in front of her. Um, there seemed to be issues where the consent wasn't sought for some of um, the, for these women being referred on to uh, weight management classes. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, and this failure to, con to contextualize risk again, that we sort of see throughout that they're big risk, they're a high risk, they can't do this, but, but never really knowing by how much more they were a risk. And obviously then that having an implication for how they would do, how they how they could give birth, and that not necessarily being well explained. Um, this was a woman who really wanted a water birth, um, and you know there would have been all sorts of reasons why that wouldn't have been advised, but no one really sat down and talked to her about them. It was just a no. And then this sense that anything that went wrong was their fault. Uh, and as I say, it's, you know, I, we felt very strongly as a research team that these women were coming away being very poorly served on the path to motherhood. But yeah, there were some very good examples of positive risk communication, um, particularly where women felt they were given the evidence and, and supported to make their own choice uh, and treated like an intelligent adult. Um, you know, this real sense of not being told, not necessarily just being told what to do, but, but given some options um was really important so yeah so trust choice and information um and yeah being trusted to to act upon um that were, were really important um so yeah i'll wrap up there um but you know i think i, I think you know our, our feeling very much is that we do need to start recentering women and, and women's own needs and appetite for risk um, in the in 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 how in in, in how we um, address this um, and and really recognize that there are certain women definitely for whom risk communication and therefore their experience of pregnancy um, really isn't working very well at the moment and I and I would say absolutely that women with higher BMIs um, uh, you know are, are really getting a raw deal at the moment so thank you Thank you, Claire. That was great and really interesting. And I think, I think understanding people's different levels of acceptance of risk, I think, is is very fascinating for me as well. I think there's so much around, as we discussed earlier with Andrew, continuity of carer, personalisation, getting to know women. That means that you can then have those more individualised conversations with them. Um, we've just got um, a question here, which is around um, whether or not you're working with any anthropologists uh, contextualising societal factors. Or anything like that. Oh well, that's a very interesting question because actually our lead researcher's background is 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 um, is as an anthropologist. But yeah, I think I, I absolutely I think it's really important that we mm. put that in the in the in the broader picture. Yeah. And I suppose the question is how again you know how how to how do we make the change? How do we make things better? What what can we do to improve this? So, so what I think is great is, and, and I think we've heard it today, you know, I, 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 it really does feel like there is more of a recognition of this as, as an issue. Um, and, you know, I think some of the projects that we've heard about that are underway are, are absolutely, you know, I think that fundamentally that's where it's got to be. I mean, I guess, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a big, you know, for me, there is a big picture issue, I think, about almost how do we start changing some of the narratives 
that where it constantly feels, you know, as, as I said, with some of the research that we see getting into the public domain, it's so mother is problem, um, you know, outcomes solely on offspring. And I think if we could just start shifting some of the narratives to also be about implications for, you know, for, for, for mothers as well. And, you know, I would, it, it would be brilliant to start reading more about, you know, perennial tear, you know, long-term impacts on, you know, on, 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 on women's morbidity as well. And I think that's, yeah, uh, that's my hope is that in time, we will start to, you know, we'll, we'll start getting there as well. But yeah, I think it's all incremental. Um, one more question around uh, risks for obese women um, and, and somebody acknowledging that we need improvement and relative risks properly explained, but do we also need to frame the discussions around finding of embrace reports, for example, because these are a higher risk group of women? Yeah, and I think the thing is, is that lots of the women we spoke to they knew they were at higher risk and a lot of them had and this you know one of the one of the things i thought was really heartbreaking actually was that so many had tried to lose a significant amount of weight before pregnancy because they were aware of the risks but that that was never that it, you know it felt like they couldn't do anything that was good enough mm -hmm. um and yeah you know i think we do need to support women and you know and, and encourage them as well but it's it, it it's it, it does feel very much to be the case that I I don't I don't think there's pure ignorance on this I think you know if anything there's a very heightened sense among women of the risk but I think we've got to find a way of communicating those risks in a way that makes sense to women that doesn't cause undue anxiety yeah I mean and we, we mentioned this before didn't we that it's not that women don't want to know um, or you know or or or, or that we should necessarily be worried about causing this undue anxiety, but the information that we convey needs to be, you know, yeah, ev evidence-based for one, um, and yeah, and and done in such a way that women can also act upon, because otherwise, it's in yeah, it can be incredibly disempowering. Mm. For me as well, I think it's also about the individualization and personalization as well, because actually we know that parity has a huge impact. <laughs> on outcomes actually um and that actually you know there's increasing evidence i think that suggests that if you're if you've got a higher bmi but actually you've had previous straightforward lab labors and births then actually you your risk is potentially a bit lower than sometimes we state maybe and sometimes i think sometimes we lump everybody together don't we with these services absolutely yeah yeah i couldn't agree more so um any more questions from any of anybody else on the, on the chat for anybody or does anybody have any questions for any of the panelists that they want to put out onto the chat group so there's one more question claire for you which is all right is this research publicly available uh, it will be yeah it will be we're hoping to publish um uh, early next year great thank you Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, so just a couple of um, other things to wrap up with then. I just thank you to all the speakers who have been fantastic and I think have generated some really interesting thought and discussions. I'm sure people will go away and discuss things. Um, please have a look on the uh, BICS website uh, regarding membership for anybody who's not a member already. Um, you will get access to the uh, Google group, which I, again just generates, I think, some really fascinating, really interesting discussions. Um, tweet us. Uh, many of us are on Twitter and you can use our Twitter handles and I'm sure you can probably get hold of some, many of the speakers on Twitter as well. And usually uh, what I would say, is, you know, as we said before in our last week's conference, um, be kind and be the change. Use these conversations to um, go back into your units and see what little things you can do. I think some of these conversations just show that little things that we can do with women can just make huge differences to their experience of their care. Um, and sometimes just those, those slight tweaks that we make um, can, can make all the difference. Um, we will we'll be putting the video on the website. We have recorded it. So thank you to all the speakers for allowing us to do that. And we have been asked, we will be asking for permission to share slides. Um, and just to promote our upcoming webinars um, for everybody, we have got um, Thursday the 12th of October with an update on preterm birth. We've got Monday the 16th, sorry, no, October, November, <laughs> a whole month behind, Monday the 16th of November, uh, which is all about Black, Asian, and minority ethnic staff services and their allies, understanding the challenges in maternity services. 
And on Monday the 23rd, we've got uh, has the medicalisation of childbirth gone too far that has already generated a fair bit of interest on Twitter because that's where all interest gets generated. Um, it's lockdown, so what better to do with your evening than join one of our webinars. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next one.